stuff that's coming up in, in machine learning is very exciting, right? Particularly in real time, this is a different aspect of it where we don't have the ability to look ahead. We have to produce, perhaps use models that are well trained but can operate very, very quickly. Um, it's also very useful for crime. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, yeah, so, you know, again, if you know me, I'm Evan McGee. I'm the CTO over at SignalWire. Um, uh, and I wanted to run through kind of the current landscape of machine learning when it comes to sort of real-time communications, because uh, it is a very special subset. And we're all very well aware of a lot of, oh, I forgot that wasn't up there, current landscape, a lot of the cloud services that are out there. And these have popped up in the past year or two and really sort of accelerated the adoption of machine learning in sort of our realm. Um, you know, the fact that Google Translate API, the Google Speech APIs have these very, very simple hooks into and they work, you know, just incredibly well. And they're really like, kind of amazingly cheap. Uh, it's, a, it's a big revolution. I think some everybody here remembers, you know, five years ago when trying to do any kind of translation stuff, or even like when Alta Vista came out in the late 90s, right? You could pump in, I used to try to pump in my German homework uh, into that, in English into German, and it was terrible. Um, and I, you know, it, it's gotten to the point now where effectively you could probably do all that old homework I had, and I would have gotten a much better grade than I did at the time. Um, and you have things like Amazon Lex and Wit.ai, which was purchased, that really allow you to do things like, you know, intent analysis, and the ability to look at human speech and parse what people are trying to get out of it. Google Dialogue Flow is a similar thing that uses the same kind of technology, sort of natural language understanding. And these are all fun cloud services that you can use and pay for. And that's great. They're there. They work great. They work amazingly well. Those companies have spent millions and millions upon millions getting them ready. But the question is, what can we do for ourselves, right? Because we're those kind of people. We're the open source kind of people. We like to do it ourselves. It's cheaper. It's more fun. Perhaps you can tailor it to your specific use case. So we're going to start with uh, one of the existing projects called Deep Speech. This is based on a Baidu research paper um, called Deep Speech, and it's a hosted Mozilla project. And what they've done was their, their goal was to exceed a 10% word error rate. That was all they really wanted to do, was make sure they can get down there. And they got, using a couple of the different corpora, they got down to about 6.5% word error rate, which was effectively as good at the time as Google, Vo uh, as Google um, ASR. I think that they have, Google ASR has now surpassed this a bunch, but you know, for still, for an open source project you can compile today, a 6.5% word error rate on English is pretty great. I think they also have Spanish and maybe German or French. Um, but one nice thing about it is that this can run in real time, right? So that 0.3x MacBook GPU scaling factor is the fact that it can run basically, you can run three of these cycles, like you can run three times faster than real time. So you can pump in your speech and it will pump out text uh, it, fast enough for us, for us to do it on like a server. And we can host this ourselves. And it uses it. I'm not going to get in this talk into, if you go back and Google an Astrocon talk I think I gave last year, um, or maybe the year before, I got into sort of the math of how this is all done and how these recombinant neural networks work uh, and a bunch of the linear algebra. And then I scared people by threatening them with differential equations and then everyone ran away. So I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, on the left-hand side there, you see that really what that is um, is an example of what that neural net looks like. You know, the bottom are three sort of like fully, um, sort of fully situational layers, followed by sort of a recombinant neural net right there, that kind of blue part kind of stuff just kind of flies back and forth. And there's like an output fully connected layer at the top there that gives you your speech. Um, again, I go look up Deep Speech. It's a really interesting project. It is a fairly complex one to set up. It's a fairly large repo. So don't think you're going to go, you know, to turn around and be like, I have my own ASR and it works amazingly well. It works great for English once you get it up and running and tune it a bunch. But it is a really, really interesting project and they're continuing to actively develop it. They've released, Baidu's released three more papers, Deep Speech 2, Deep Speech 3 all of which cover more advanced topics of how to do this. Um, so it's kind of impressive that, the, that Baidu as a company is releasing these kind of things. You expect it more from guys like Google, who released Tacotron. Tacotron is a speech synthesis algorithm. Um, originally released in March 2017, Tacotron 2 is December 2017. They added the prosody. Prosody is like intonation inflection. You know, the prosody is the, when I talk like this, I'm adding some prosody. And like, you, know, you can sort of, I talk like this, I'm adding some prosody. Like you can sort of manipulate that around. Google has basically figured out how to take out the sort of hyperparameters of speech and manipulate existing models to generate that sort of audio. And I'm going to demonstrate it here for you in a second. Um, and they did that. The original one, this is sort of like they had an original, initial version of this where they actually have the text sequence that does sort of the, the traditional, their traditional version of Tacotron speech synthesis in the bottom there. And basically some reference audio that gave them the idea of like what this sort of levels of speech sound like. Um, they then switched that around, right? They actually took that away and added a whole other layer there uh, that does just sort of more neural networky recombinant stuff after it goes to the prosody. Because what they figured out was they really need to just like, just like hyper tune down on the idea of what those weird inflections and parts of speech are. Um, 
They put these style tokens in in March 2018. That was right about the same time that Google launched their new WaveNet voices on Google Speech, if you ever use those. They're much better, and they're based on exactly this. So Google took this Tacotron project, the first paper of that in March 2017, and productized it and put it into Google ASR in less than a year. And that's kind of incredible. So when you go use Google right now, understand that this is the kind of stuff that's coming out soon. They just put this stuff out, style tokens, in March. Um, I would expect by sometime in 2019, you'll be able to you know, pay for this at about 2.4 cents a word. Um, but let's give an example here, maybe. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with okay. leathery skin, smooth, edible flesh, and a large stone. Okay, so that was an example of a very noisy, like very sort of like artificially induced, that was sort of a traditional way you might generate it from some bad data. When they added the second layer of prosody inflection there, this is what happened to it. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. So that was just a good example of where they like, they had a, that was their previous version of Tacotron was the first one, and this new stuff added up that, that clarity. United Airlines 563 from Los Angeles to New Orleans has landed. So that is an artificially generated voice. That's not a real human. This is the same one with a different couple of different prosody settings. United Airlines 563 from Los Angeles to New Orleans has landed. Happy Halloween, everyone. <laughs> so that's great, right? That's the exact same model, just tuned very slightly differently. Totally different output, totally different people. Here's another version. Thinking that he should probably wait for Filch to come back, Harry sank into a moth-eaten chair next to the desk. There was only one thing on it apart from his half-completed form. A large, glossy purple envelope with silver lettering on the front. So very polite, right? I could listen to that for hours. Sounds like a great car book, audio book. Thinking that he should probably wait for Filch to come back, Harry sank into a moth-eaten chair next to the desk. There was only one thing on it apart from his half-completed form. A large, glossy purple envelope with silver lettering on the front. So imagine now we can do this, I mean, and there are many, many more examples of this. You can make it sound like a teenager, you can make it sound like, you know, someone who's uh, like actively sobbing. And this is off the same trained model. So suddenly you have one voice that can be in many different scenarios. And let's say you add some emotion detection to someone on the phone, right? And you're generating this in real time in a chatbot style. Maybe you can address them like in a very much more comforting tone. You can actually adjust this on the fly. The voices actually adjust to the end user experience. Um, and this is gonna be here very, very soon. Um, and that goes back down also then to some, some of the natural language understanding. So RASA NLU is an open source version of basically a natural language understanding framework. It's effectively the same thing as wit.ai or Dialogflow. You pump stuff in here. I gave a demo of this one a few years ago as well. They've come a long way. You can see over here I have like, uh, you know, you, you have a bunch of intents over here we're looking for. And then over there I have something saying like, I want something delicious and the project is Astrakhan model. And what I figured out from that was that I was trying to do a restaurant search. Uh, I wanted something for a firm, like the confidence on goodbye down there is like 11%, so that's not accurate. But the confidence on restaurant search was about 45%. That's just sort of typical intent analysis. And you can build this up. So are you going to copy dialogue flow with this, or like wit? And probably not. But if you need some sort of like natural language understanding tool for the text you have, you can just run this right now. I think there are Docker containers out there. I built some. I know there are better ones. And you can just run them, and you can have this today. Like if you need a very simple intent analysis engine. Uh, and it works surprisingly well, and it's incredibly fast. So I would, the guys at Ross are, are, are pretty great guys. Um, but guess what? You might think like, oh, all right, cool. Well, maybe I'm using some of these services. Maybe I'm not. But if you're using anything today, you're using this machine learning today. You're using it in places you don't even know about. And a great example is in VP9. Um, is there any text in here? Oh, yeah. Let's go. I don't know why it didn't pop up. So VP9 has a built-in machine learning encoding model. Basically, for 4K, they figured out that encoding 4K video and that kind of stuff was just too darn slow. So what they did was an intern uh, over one, I think, the Google Summer of Code went through and basically used a multi-level neural net classifier to, to speed up the encoding. And what it did was build a cost function around encoding. VP9 encodes things by, by in super blocks, like 64 by 64 super blocks, all the way down to 4 by 4. And they used to recursively search all those to figure out which one is the most optimal one in the previous model. Well, what this young man did was he went through and he said, OK, well, I'll build a cost function that says when I get to a certain part, I'll run it through this neural model. And it says, OK, well, you've probably reached the best encoding super block size. It might be 64 by 64, in which case you can cut off the encoding and move on to the next frame. Or it might have to go all the way down to 4K. The point is, using this, I think the, the decrease in quality was something like less than like 0.3 or 0.4%. And the increase in time was 25%. So they gained 25% speed increase. And that is basically, those are the, that's the model, like those are the matrices, you know, linear algebra. Those are the matrices you apply to the function right there in the code. The entire commit for this in the VP9 was like 120 lines, right? After it was all trained and said and done, 120 lines they put in there, 25% speed increase. It's pretty great. Like, that's pretty cool. 
So I want you to know how to use this stuff and you can manipulate TensorFlow or PyTorch to generate these things. You can actually just dumping them into existing code and getting pretty massive speed increases and some pretty great results. And so this stuff all exists today. You can go download all this stuff or you're using it today. The question is, what exists tomorrow? Like what's coming down the pike? What am I excited about? Uh, if you didn't see that, I'm already excited about it. But what's going to be cool in the future? Well, one thing that's going to be cool is this thing called Razor. This is a Google, another Google. I recommend, by the way, if you're interested in this, going to the Google AI blog if they do a lot of talk every week about interesting things they're working on. But Razor is basically like a, a machine learned version of um, upscaling, upsampling, right? So what it does, traditional you know, bicubic upsampling applies linear filters to an image. It takes like surrounding pixels, applies a certain thing to them to make like, and it expands it out, and that's how you get a larger image. It's not super great. We all know it kind of gets fuzzy. You can't really tell over here, but like the fuzziness on the left-hand image is the original low resolution. There's a middle one there. It's the traditional um, linear upscaling filters, and the one on the far left there is the one that is done by Razor. So what they did was say, OK, we're going to take a low-res image and a high-res image, and we can directly compare those and try to sort out like, what pixel edge functions like, work to the, get to that point. But that's very slow. They found a faster way was to take a low-res image, use a cheap version of an upscaling, use a traditional upscaling mechanism, and then analyze that upscale version versus the actual high-res version and figure out which upscaling, which traditional linear upscaling filter was the one that produced the best output for that like, pixel range. And then when you do that, you figure out like, how the model is weighted, which one works in certain conditions, and you can apply that to images, and you can get a much, much higher resolution looking image. And there are much better ones out there too. So imagine taking like, you know, super grainy, low bandwidth, you, let's talk about this in our context, right? You're sending across some video frames, some audio frames, uh, audio, video frames, or still images for some reason, and you want to decrease the bandwidth, so you decrease the resolution on them. And then you just rely on the client side software to upscale those back to native. Um, thereby saving bandwidth and maybe perhaps saving money for yourself or for your clients or whoever you're working with. Um, and they said this runs about 10 to 100 times faster than, than the current way to super upscale things. And it's fast enough to run on a phone in real time. Um, so that's a pretty exciting thing that's going to be coming down the line. And can actually, you could probably build it today with just a little bit of work. Um, RR Noise is a project by Mozilla. These guys, this is a learning noise suppression model. What they did was take just a whole bunch of data from very, very noisy environments. Right? And the guys who were using it were really, they're DSP engineers, they were, but they were upset with LibDSP. They didn't think it worked that well. They were like, it's 50% science and 50% art trying to figure out like, how to remove noise from things. And it's the same as it's been since the 70s, effectively. So what he did was say, OK, well, I'm not going to get rid of DSP because it's super important and it works. What I'm going to do is apply a neural model to tweaking the parameters of the DSP to see if I can get it to just work better. Because it just is apparently it's an endless variety of things. And I'm not, a D, I'm not an electrical engineer. I have you know, not spent a lot of time in that. My background is mostly just physics. But I do understand that what they did was voice activity detection, followed by like a spectral filter, followed by spectral subtractions. So they would find the voice activity that started, find whatever spectral frequencies were outside voice range, and then just subtract those. Not super great. Um, if you go to that website up top, they have a great example of what this actually sounds like. You can play, he has a great demo on his site where you can actually play with it in real time and subtract noise from your voice or from the background. Um, and it's, you know, he, the, the researcher designed this to run, again, like 60 times faster than real time. So you could apply this noise reduction filter to, like, to whatever you wanted on a phone. It like, works for WebRTC. It does a really great job. Um, so I mean, this is an exciting thing, too, where, again, we're not throwing away existing libraries or techniques. We're improving on them. We're adding things to them to help tune them or make them better because the existing ways just have reached sort of the art of uh, you have to hire somebody who knows how to twiddle it. And this is basically like an auto-twiddling feature um, that just works amazingly well. Some things coming in the line, too, are things like network improvements, right? So this gets a little bit more, like, less exciting, but it's things that are kind of really interesting, right? Right now, we use just metrics and calls, you know, jitter and MOS scores, things like that. Well, what if there were things that we could do to do network improvements that didn't just rely on those traditional metrics, right? You could utilize supervised or unsupervised learning systems. The difference between those two are supervised learning systems you feed data into, you pre-scrub it, and that's the hidden secret of all machine learning, right, is you have to have very, very tightly controlled pre-scrub data. You pre-send it in, supervise the learning, get some results. Unsupervised means it learns by itself. Um, but you could figure out if you had network issues, have an unsupervised learning system that's like watching your network, particularly if you do things uh, like I love to, which is moving containers all around planet Earth and different VMs spinning up in different clouds. Like there's a lot of different things that can go wrong. Perhaps you're on a shared VM that has some sort of like horrible overload issue or they're actually having a network issue. Um, some of the guys who found out about you know, Melter and Spe uh, Spe Spectre and Meltdown, 
some of them were doing similar work like this and just noticed weird variations in some of their un, unsupervised learning systems. And they're like, why is that? Um, you can do things like use you know, post-call metrics. You can do this for fraud. You can do this for any kind of thing you want to apply your data to on a network level. Um, you could basically say, like, you could adjust on the fly for network conditions. Let's say the unsupervised model is running. It notices that there's like, some bandwidth loss somewhere. You could have it actively change bit rates for people. You could just basically make it like, a, like Skynet that kind of like, knows in the cloud what's happening. And instead of having to code these with a lot of if-thens, you just have a model that runs that kind of helps you out with that. There's also the idea of selective encoding. This one I'm actually really excited about, too. I think it's really fun. Basically, you know, we're getting really good at feature detection and object extraction. Well, half the time, in a lot of these areas, right, we can pull out just the things that are changing. If I'm video chatting with you and I have them just sitting in front of a camera, really all that's changing is my face. Right? Maybe I'm gesturing around, maybe something's happening, but mostly it's just this. So why are we sending full frames of video? We don't, like, why are we sending the background? Like, we're just sending like, the same data over and over again. If my wife walks by in the background of my video chat or my kid pops up, like, A, you don't need to see that. You don't want to see that, and be like, we're just wasting, we're wasting bandwidth there, sending that across. If we could just extract me from that image, pull me out, only encode me, and have the far ends replicate the background as a static one, unless it's told otherwise, we can save a lot of you know, bandwidth that way, and a lot of probably encoding time. Um, so that's kind of an exciting thing that I think is going to be a very useful feature, particularly on mobile. And I know bandwidth is going to get more and more and more, but we're going to be sending higher and higher quality video. So we're going to have to decide maybe selectively what we want to send. You don't send everything. You just send the thing you want to see. Um, again, with, going back to the example of like my wife or somebody walking around, there's also the idea that like maybe a lot of the conversations we have with video or even audio don't really matter. Um, you know, in the sense that when we're talking to each other, it's mostly trying to do an information transfer so we can accomplish some sort of task. We're not recording it, we're not archiving it for posterity. We just need to get the point across. So maybe the fidelity of that doesn't need to be as high. And that's, you know, what I mean by that is that, again, removing backgrounds, right, you might not see something in the background. Or if you just encode my face and it's just this moving around, but I start moving my hands around or typing or whatever else, but you don't see that, it just shows you me just sitting there, who cares? Who cares if you don't see that? Does it matter? Maybe it doesn't. Um, and in this particular case, you heard those voices earlier, combining that prosody stuff with the idea that you can send like word text pairs, imagine we had a perfect model of Matt Fredrickson's voice, right, a perfect model of it, it sounds just like him. Well, why would he need to go you know, anywhere and talk to anybody, he can just type it out and have the machine talk for him. Like, isn't that good enough? Like, what if we're on super low bandwidth stuff and we need to shoot across text and it recreates basically what he would have vaguely sounded like? And Matt doesn't care, right? It's awesome. Saves him some time, makes the bandwidth better. You can do a lot with that. So there, here's an example of this too, is that we, uh, one of our engineers, I don't know if you guys know Chris Rienzo, he's an amazing guy, um, but he went online just the other day. A couple companies now started to do this. One of them's called Lyrebird. And what he did was give them 20 minutes of your voice, and they will create your own voice. So, this is a machine that sounds like me. So I'm going to do that again. This is a machine that sounds like me. This is a machine that sounds like me. So that first one was him. The second one was the machine. So let's try it again real quick. This is a machine that sounds like me. So that's really Chris. He sounds like a robot. <laughs> and then here's the machine again. This is a machine that sounds like me. And it sounds almost identical, right? That was, he did that last night? I think I asked him to go do that. He, he, had, he had done the machine one, and we were like, ha! And I was like, can you just record that same thing? And I didn't think he'd do it literally identically, but um, that's great. So I think that's very exciting, right? This is the kind of stuff that we can kind of do now. Companies are coming out with this, and applying some of these things we're talking about. You know, within a year, I'd be surprised if you don't see a lot of this stuff sort of out there commercially, or open source projects that allow you to do this. Something like avatars, video avatars of ourselves. But anyway, let's move on to some crime, right? Everyone loves crime. Crime's great. Uh, there's my classic picture of Matt Jordan. Um, so you weren't here last night, last year. That's if you Google Matt Jordan, that's the guy who comes up most often. Um, so again, with a little those 20 minutes of audio, you can recreate your own voice. So that's what Chris did. You can do it today. Anyone here can do it. Um, last year, I was talking about how I was trying to recreate Matt Jordan's voice from his. Uh, YouTube audio captures of all the talks he's given. Uh, I didn't succeed because I didn't put enough computing time behind it and some of the stuff fell apart. But the idea was that we all give a lot of talks, we're all up here doing a lot of this kind of stuff, we're generally recorded. The idea that we're going to be duplicated at some point is extraordinarily high, right? I've had my Instagram account, I think I was followed by a buddy of mine who's in a comedy band who has like 75,000 followers or more. And like the next day, like I literally had three copies of my Instagram account, which is just me and my kids like eating ice cream or going on a hike or me at a winery and there's a lot of those. So like, it's weird, like people are going to copy you at some point. So we gotta get ready for that. 
We've got to figure out what we're going to do about that. You know, some sort of verification, some sort of identity stuff. Is there some sort of blockchain thing we can do to do when you record something, that you actually record the um, um, providence of where that information came from? Had to work blockchain in here somewhere. Um, hey, Don, have you heard about this new technology? Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? Yes, it is developed by a startup called Wirebird. This is huge. They can make us say anything now, really anything. The good news is that they will offer the technology to anyone. This is huge. How does their technology work? Hey, guys, I think that they use deep learning and artificial neural networks. Hillary is right, and I can tell you that their team is great. I wish them good luck. I'm sure they will do a good job. I know, right? Like, it wasn't perfect. But you know 30% of people will be like, oh, that was absolutely Trump. That was absolutely Barack. Like it, it, and that, and that is, that's just what we have right today. Like That can be generated right today. So what else do we have here? The Norsemen considered the rainbow as a bridge over which the gods passed from Earth to their home in the sky. So that's the real, that's the real woman talking. He was being fitted for ruling the state in the words of his biographer. That was the fake one. Here's the forecast for the next four days. Fake one, right? Same woman, two fake ones. The first one was real, almost indistinguishable. 人恒过，然后能改；困于心，恒于虑而后作；争于色，发于声，而后喻。So that is a Chinese researcher working on machine learning and voice stuff. A long time ago, the second December, a cup of water. So that is his voice speaking English. So I mean, that's the kind of thing. If you can't, if you, yeah, this goes back to my German homework. If you thought I was bad at it then, wait until I'm artificially speaking German. 10 times better than I ever really did. Um, and we all know about deep fakes, probably. Who here knows about deep fakes? Raise your hand. They're used for more of a not safe for work part of the internet, but they actually do have some pretty amazing tech behind them, right? And it's examples of what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> no, I was, I was like, did I copy the wrong thing? Right? So that came out of Berkeley about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, right? They have those target dancers. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing where, sure, I'm up here, suddenly I'm like walking around, I'm talking in my own voice. It's, it will be very easy to confuse people. Um, and they have more things just for, for fun, right? Like, it, everyone knows that Nick Cage is a dramatic actor, but I think you've never seen him in some of these roles before. You're looking well, Jean-Luc. Rested. I won't let you move them, Admiral. I will take this to the Federation Council. I'm acting on orders from the Federation Is that Patrick Council. Stewart or is that Nick Cage? How can there be an order to abandon the Prime Directive? Prime Directive doesn't apply. Right? Not indigenous to this planet. They will never... So the next one. So there's one more of these. It's another great one. First I was afraid. I was petrified. Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. But I spent oh so many nights just thinking how you did me wrong. But I grew strong. And I learned how Probably to get along. Really and now you're back from the space. face turns. You just Watch. walked in and saw me here right with that same look, the look upon my face. Up the I should have changed that stupid lock. I should have made you. It looks great. Right? So, like, that's pretty impressive. If you showed me that, I'd be like, well, I don't know why Nick Cage is in drag singing that song. Plus, he's got a lovely voice. Um, but that's the thing, is they pulled so much, there's so many photos of him in so many different lighting conditions, they can extract all those facial features and, and just and put them on somebody else. Uh, and that's pretty amazing. And there are, there are open source libraries that do that in real time, and they're not nearly that good, but they're not nearly that bad either. Like, they're pretty great. Uh, so this stuff's coming, right? This stuff's all coming. And where does this lead us to? I mean, what's the real like worries behind this? The identity, identity theft, right? The idea that like my mother could call me or do a video chat with me and tell me she needs me to fly to Seattle because my dad died or something like that, and I need to just go up there right away and I leave the house and I get robbed. I mean, that's a very like pedestrian example. But things like that will happen, right? People fall for you know those scam IRS things over the phone. You know, imagine it's your mother saying you she's having the IRS at her house right now and you have to drive across town. Um, That'll, this will happen to people, package theft, any kind of thing like that, any kind of impersonation. Uh, and psychological manipulation, imagine like gaslighting or trying to mess with like an ex who you really you know, were nefarious against uh, and you just like make them think people are talking to them or not. Like, there's a lot of very subtle things you can do to people here using this kind of technology. And so we as people who, are sort of under, who understand how it's done and are building it need to keep in mind as we create these tools, maybe like the eventual uses of them 
to see that if we can head some of them off or if we can figure out you know, ways to say, hey, what you're looking at is obviously not real, what you're looking at is obviously made by a computer. Uh, I think it's just, it just is beholden upon us to do that. I think the ideas of like stir shake and that kind of stuff has shown us that even with like, you know, you need to put some idea of uh, reality and a sense of like community and society into these projects as well. Because um, they are amazingly fun and amazingly useful and they'll be incredible and they are incredible. Um, but I think we have a responsibility to also try to be, you know, be thoughtful about it in the context of everybody else. Uh, but again, hi everybody, I'm Evan McGee. Um, I'm over uh, at SignalWire. You can reach me at Startled Marmot. Uh, and thanks again. Thanks so much. Okay, before we get to questions, two comments. Yeah. One, what you just showed was very 1986, the movie Looker. Yeah. Where they scan the models and then kill them off and then use their images in advertising and stuff like that. See, same stuff. Okay. <laughs> what we had 30 years ago as science fiction, he's now showing us as today. Yeah. Be very afraid. Number two, California just passed a law on your voice bots. Yeah. As of July 1st, 19, uh, 2019, Bots are required to tell you that they're not human beings. Can't hide it in the fine print. Have to tell you that you're really talking to a bot or you're using a chat bot. Mm -hmm. Huge fines if this happens in uh, California. You just signed the law on, on Friday, I think it was. I'm from California, so that makes perfect sense. Yeah, so you, your, your governor just signed it this go, week. Go, good old Jerry Bears. I love that guy. Okay. Questions? Time to get my step count up. Evan, can you just go back to uh, what was the name of the company that takes the 20 minutes of speech? Because I kind of missed that part. They're called Liarbird. They were a group of researchers, I think, out of the University of Montreal that had a specific version of that encoding technology that they went and realized was pretty significantly advanced at the time and went to found a company. Uh, and I thought they would come out something a little bit sooner. It's been about a year, but they're out there. They're doing it. It's called, they're called Liarbird, L-Y-R-E-B-I-R-D. Others? I was kind of expecting you to actually finish the dangerous demo from last year as part of the talk today. You know, I thought about it, but I was like, ah, there's too much context there. I'll just use a picture of Matt Jordan. <laughs> I'm also very busy building a company, so. Other questions? Comments? Complaints? Scared people? <laughs> I would encourage everybody to go play with this stuff, too. Did, didn't out. they use this technology in Fast and the Furious 7 for Paul Walker? His brother played the parts, and they CGI'd his face and voice him using it's similar. It's similar. The difference there is that those were visual artists who actually took renderings and like did it frame by frame by hand. But it's a similar type stuff, right? It's like basically a computer doing exactly that, re-rendering over somebody's body. Um, but instead of being able to manipulate it frame by frame and spend you know, $20 million doing it, or you know, that's excessive, but this is just like you do it in, you know, couple seconds and you can reapply it to a bunch of different people at once. Other questions? Okay, I'll throw one. Yeah. Out of all the ones that you did, the Harry Potter stuff and stuff, which would you say is the best one to actually create the audiobook out of something? You mean which of the voices or which of the source materials? For voices. You actually had two vo one voice in two different um, versions reading Harry Potter and yeah. the silver writing on the chair. What do you think would be the best one to do something like that? Mm. Like the best, are you asking the best software package or the best actual voice? Both. Oh, okay. Um, to do that, I mean, that's part of the Tacotron Google Prosody stuff. So we'd have to go do is there are Tacotron uh, GitHub repos that are, this is all public research. People have gone to recreate that. The issue is you need the actual like voice training data. That's a little bit harder to find. Um, there are free available corpora for voices out there. So you'd have to go find one. I think my best thing would be to go partner with Allison and have Allison generate just a whole bunch of audio or take one of her existing things and jam it through one of these Tacotron things with Prosody and suddenly you'll have your own virtual bedside Allison to read your Harry Potter all night. I think she would appreciate that and I think it would be, you know, it would just satisfy everyone. You have heard her stories of, what was it, she did it to Capera or one of these uh, services and ended up arguing with herself yes. in the audio version? Yes. So. In the future, I look forward to a, somebody calling me and telling me via, via me that I need to get out of the house because my house is on fire. Something like that. It's going to happen. Can't wait to talk to myself. 
This is definitely be afraid time. This is, I know, it's great. Don't be afraid. Just, you know, just accept. So, <laughs> something we actually talked about last night that I wanted you to reiterate maybe for them um, yeah. was about um, the future of voice artists, right? Oh, yeah. Voice over. about that. Right? Um, maybe just reiterate what we talked about last night, which was like, um, like for someone like Allison Smith, she's probably fine, but the 16-year-old yep. Allison Smith exactly. in the future. Exactly. And the, the TLDR of that story is that I went to a talk uh, from the ex-head of DARPA in L.A., and I, I, was, I asked them about voice synthesis, and they, took, they brought up actually the whole crime aspect and how they were concerned at the government level about this. And so there was a conversation about that at this open house, and I get into an elevator, get downstairs, and behind me is James Vanderbeek, who like pokes me in the shoulder and just goes, don't take my jobs, man. And I was like, well, hi, James. And uh, I was like, well, man, I, I told him, I'm like, hey, it's not you, your job is fine. You're James Vanderbeek, like your voice and image will, all, you have lawyers and agents, and like, you're fine. You'll probably just make residuals forever based on your virtual Vanderbeekedness. Uh, but 16-year-old James Vanderbeek, the new kid coming up, is going to have a crappy lawyer or a bad agent, is going to sign a deal and have an amazing voice and be used for the next thousand years for GM commercials, right, and be paid nothing. Uh, so the idea of like revolution, of sort of upturning the idea of voiceover artists is a real thing, right? You know, animation, all that kind of stuff. The existing people are there, but the next crop coming up might have a very different industry that they're merging into. Um, and so I don't know, you know how that's going to play out, but certainly they're looking at it, right? That talent is expensive and they've got to fly them in a lot. Have you seen those fights with like the Fox and the Simpsons uh, voices, artists? Like what, imagine if they never had any contract fights, you know? Or the contract fight becomes, I want to reuse that 16-year-old guy's voice, but then it's just like a software company or a lawyer who owns the rights to it. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to charge you X amount for like a generated audio of this guy, you know? This all started with Mel Blanc and his recording all of those little bits that they use in uh, the cartoons. Yeah, yeah. Why even start with somebody's voice in the first place? Why not just create it all from scratch? Exactly. I mean, you can have your own, your own custom voice that just sounds like literally no one. Or take several, blend them together so it's something unique. Yep, exactly. Ah, all the way in the back. Yeah, step, step counts. Step, 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 step. <laughs> My wife appreciates this. How much massaging is necessary on the, t the TTS synthesis samples that you gave? Like, you know, like the mm -hmm. Harry Potter, mm -hmm. Harry Potter ring? That was really good. Yeah. Um, like with the voice intonations and things like that. I yeah. mean, how much work is there beyond dumping in a, you know, a, a copy and paste section of text sure. into the into the machine to, to make it come out sounding decently. Sure. So those were those were examples from Google's actual research doing this. That's using like Google levels of uh, voice data to capture that. And like I think that woman probably had several thousand hours, if not ten thousand hours, they recorded. Um, actually tuning those and doing that in real time, it's just a simple like hyperparameter change. So it's very very small. Like you're you're tweaking uh, maybe I think in that case it was like two dozen different different variables effectively to generate that. Over that speech section? Mm -hmm. Well, over, like you basically tune it once at the beginning and it just generates it that way. Pause length, intonation, you know, you basically set it like to what you want to kind of, you basically like have to, it, that's where the art of it comes in where you have to listen to it and be like, is this what I want? Redo it again, and because it's not exactly a one-to-one -one mapping of like this causes this, right? Yeah. You might tweak that and that and it changes a whole bunch of stuff. So you gotta tune it for what you're looking for and be like good enough, which makes it a little bit cool because it's all variable, but. It's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a black box in that way. A lot, yeah. of the neural, a lot of the neural net stuff is, right? You'll have vectors of 128 million vectors that all feed down and feed back again. And if you try to look at it in any one given spot, you just, it's like impossible to see what's happening. Um, but you tune a couple of those a little bit differently. Once you get the model built at the far end, hopefully you've reduced those vectors down enough so the final output vector is something simple enough that you can kind of more vaguely understand. Uh, but how it actually gets there sometimes is hard to see. Thanks. No worries. Other questions? How hard was it to make your multi-person conversation each with a different voice consistently? My multi-party conversation? Which one? Barack, Hillary, oh, and, that and one. Donald. That was a demo from Liarbird themselves. They had, they had done that. Yeah. So you, I, you, you didn't have to say, okay, Obama says this, Donald responds, kind of programming no, it, and they, they did that. They have fortunately actually locked, they have locked those voices behind a thing where I can't just go generate random Donald Trump stuff. And I think they, they realized right away that was a bad idea. But they, they, delightfully, they delightfully put out some, some, demo, some samples of what they can do, and then they want you to go record your own voice. Sort of a, the point is to get you in there to do your own thing. These days with the old uh, scissor and tape thing, you can do an awful lot with his voice. You certainly can. Other questions, comments? Okay, thank you, Evan. Thank oh, you, guys. Yeah. One last. Oh, one last one. 
how does this, um, there's supposed to be a digital, well, not digital, uh, your voice has a unique like fingerprint mm -hmm. and you can be recognized by that. How does like the machine learning voices created will come to sure. recreate that? Sure. Those are usually histogram, like I know that the way that um, like music fingerprinting is done, right? In fact, on the Google AI blog, if you go there right now, they just talked about the new way that Google does like their Shazam style music recognition. They use a machine learning model inside uh, the Google Now system to do that very, very quick musical analysis. Um, and it's a similar thing. It's basically an audio fingerprint using, I believe it's, a, it's, not, it's, not, it's histogram based. Um, it's some very, very fast function effectively. But the point being that, yeah, if you had a different, you know, I don't know how the histogrammatical analysis of, say, like those two Harry Potter voices, they do sound like the same person, just like maybe reading something differently. I don't know if they would fingerprint identically, right? So for voice biometrics, this is a concern, right? Because if you can replicate me, you can replicate my voice. You know, my voice is my passport. Verify me. And like, you get in there, that will be something to really worry about. You know? So two-factor auth with voice bioidentification is probably not as secure as you might want it to be at this point, if it ever really was. OK, everybody, thank you. And a round of applause for Evan and scaring Thanks us. Thanks for coming.